today I'll be doing a few presentations on the, what the UC program is and specifically in the next presentation, this is just a short one, the next one will uh, focus a little bit on what, what uh, are the new features and stuff, uh, starting from the later versions, 9, 10, 11, 12, which is the current one. Uh, just to bring you up to date a little bit, because I think the last time I did this presentation in the US was 2008, maybe, so. And there's, there's some new stuff. Uh, okay, so let's get going first. Uh, uh, what the music program is, and how to use it. Okay, let's leave this code over there quickly. Um, the next slide, this is what, uh, what this presentation is uh, so about. Uh, what they, do you see is, it's an uh, operating system neutral utility thing. It started out as a disk utility on OS2, but fairly quickly uh, I decided to make it more generic, so I was also able to use it uh, on, uh, on DOS and on Windows, and later on uh, Linux, uh, even at first it running on the Mac with some limitations. Uh, the main purpose I started with uh, was because there were few utilities on OS2 that could really dig down into the file systems and the uh, disk partitioning stuff, apart from the FDisk stuff that was around at that time, it was fairly limited. Uh, and you see, I started with the UC, I think in 1992, 93, something like that, uh, as an HPFS file system browser, uh, and it evolved to a full uh, disk utility over the years. I used mainly myself for partitioning. Uh, for making backups and stuff like that of the system uh, and for solving problems with file systems myself uh, but over the last uh, 10 or 15 years also for a lot of uh, customers who are using the use. Okay, so what you do with it, you can examine and modify data on your disks or file systems or files or whatever. Uh, DUC is generic in, in the sense that it just views and things like a large collection of data sectors, so just bunches of uh, bytes, characters, whatever you want to call And uh, DUC can uh, look at those things on the physical disks or distributions or volumes that you can only access by a drive letter maybe, you don't have physical access to. Uh, or on regular files, like uh, raw image files that you can take from partitions or disks, or maybe from other tools. Uh, and you can view data either raw, uh, which is uh, probably in hexadecimal format or something else, uh, which is very low level, not very useful for most people. Uh, so there are also a lot of format of displays that you see that uh, allows you to look at partition tables, look at file system structures like directories or allocation tables, stuff like that. <coughs> for various uh, file systems. Okay, at the moment, uh, this is a, a rather old presentation, as you can see, 2005. Uh, so there have been a few updates, one of the updates is it, so there's also a uh, uh, Macintosh version, OS X version at the moment. It's a text-based uh, program, so it's not graphical uh, at the moment. Uh, I'm still considering like a QT version, but that's really a lot of work because mm -hmm. apart from the user interface, uh, I also have to uh, update the internals to, to match that coding for the user interface. So it's, it's a real big task, but it would allow me to have a much better support on the Linux and Macintosh, for instance, uh, where at the moment I'm lacking the mouse support due to the very low level of integration I have with those systems. Uh, it's text based in that, uh, especially 10, 15 years ago, that was uh, almost the only way you could easily run off a, a DOS bootable disket or something uh, and have your program run fully functional without uh, relying on anything like Windows or, or whatever. Uh, okay, so this is what I talked about earlier. You see, it just looks at the uh, stores as, as sectors. Uh, and uh, on opening 
things like volumes or partitions or this is to just look at those sectors and you see we'll look at contents of sectors and see how, how to best display stuff. So or, or it seems six point X version uh, it was two thousand and five, so twelve but now. Uh, it's also possible these days to create a memory stick, USB stick, 
then has that same uh, bootable system on it. So you can boot FreeDOS with uh, DFS uh, or Linux, which is an MD stick. That's still one of the old ones, but uh, these days I have uh, the smaller ones. You can create your own. There's actually a menu item in here you see to uh, transform uh, any USB stick to a bootable DFC one. The only thing you have to do after that is copy a few ISO files like the latest uh, DFC uh, ISO that you can download to that memory stick and then it will be functional. It doesn't work on all systems, unfortunately, but it works on most uh, big pads and other laptops that have the ability to boot from uh, USB devices. Okay, this so conversation will be about. Quickly, who am I? What have I done? I'm a software engineer, really. I uh, have an education in electrical engineering, but uh, I've been, been a software engineer all my life, really. Uh, started in the, uh, in the 80s, so uh, my main language uh, in programming is uh, C. Later, also, I uh, C++ and Rx, and the VSP, stuff like that. But still, 90-95% uh, of my work has been in C. Uh, the last, uh, Five, six years have also done a lot of embedded software uh, developments of appliances and devices and stuff, electronics uh, and has software in it, and all of that is uh, in C. So. Uh, I worked at the consultancy firm for uh, about 15 years, but in 2001 I quit. Uh, I found a other company to uh, develop that software on their own and get out of that treadmill of uh, consultancy. And, uh, it was just more talk and blah blah than real work. I decided to do what uh, I like most of the software. Uh, by that time, I already had a, a DFC, which was a bigger thing at that point. Uh, and I uh, turned it into a more or less commercial product. Uh, it's been available for sale uh, through the lenses uh, ever since that time. The other presentations I want to complete that it uh, tells you a little more about what you can do with PUC. It's mainly partitioning and system analysis, system recovery, uh, partitioning, stuff like that. All the presentations are on my website, by the way, so if you want to look at the live and the download, you can do it. This is one of the main areas created and maintaining partitions. You so create the delete commands or use the uh, menu items that are for the same purpose. Uh, it includes support for LVM, which is a logical volume manager that was introduced with OS2 uh, a long time ago already. Uh, and a few other participant tools on the market support that because it was an OS2 only thing really. Uh, I don't think there's any other commercial tool that really supports LVM outside of the uh, IBM tools and uh, tools that are that come with the ECOM station these days. Uh, there's also a partition table editor so you can do low level edits uh, of partition table. Uh, it's still at a higher level than just the bytes that you can look at them in a uh, formatted way. Uh, you can make uh, changes that go beyond just creating or deleting partitions, but you can specifically change the uh, size to exact number of seconds and stuff like that, if you need to or want to. Uh, and then for partitions, there are various uh, commands that will alter some properties of the partition, like the partition types, and also fix stuff to uh, align partitions exactly on cylinder boundaries, stuff like that, and then fix incompatibilities with other tools or programs uh, to make everything better or without uh, additional problems. Another important thing uh, uh, using DFC is imaging. You can 
and uh, copy contents of uh, partitions or whole disks or whatever range of sectors you, you can select. Uh, copy those to a file that you can store elsewhere or move to another system. Uh, you can also compress those files on a maybe for, for a 100 gig partition, you can probably end up with 20 gig uh, image files on depending on what type of content is on the partition. Um, so what imaging is doing is, is, is taking one of the things that you see can look at, so that's a whole disk or a partition or whatever, uh, and put that into a regular file. So uh, an important thing that most people uh, are not really aware of is that in this sense, DFC is just an application like any other. Uh, and to write that file, the image file, it will need operating system access uh, to store that file somewhere. So if, if you're running the DOS version of DFC, there's not a lot of choice. The only thing you can access from DOS or free DOS will be a fat file system. That's about it. So uh, there are a few restrictions in that sense. But if you're running on other tools, for instance, you can save your files in JFS, uh, get new image files, or you can get it on HDFS and have a to be the button in it, stuff like that. So, uh, it's just creating uh, files for you uh, that you can transfer to other systems or use as backup or whatever. Uh, but you have to have access to those files. And also, if you want to restore them, same thing. Uh, most of the systems want to store them on the network, of course, so it's on the server somewhere. Uh, but still, you need access to those files. There's also smart technology uh, in, in imaging and also in cloning. And smart means that DFC is uh, smart enough to look into the file system and skip all the areas that are not really used. So you know, uh, for instance, uh, partition that's for the file system that's uh, just 10% used, it will only image those 10%, just skip the rest. Because there may be a lot of garbage in those other sectors uh, that maybe don't even compress very well. Uh, you want to skip those because otherwise your image files get much so much larger than you need to be. Uh, one other important thing to note is that if you uh, restore images, the same goes for cloning, which is the next slide, uh, you can you can restore them to different objects. So uh, if you if you make an image from a partition, you can restore it to another partition, but the size is the best. So the size has to be exactly the same or a little bit bigger. It doesn't really hurt because it's wasted some space then. Uh, what it will not do is automatically resize the file system to fit in a partition you choose. So that's, if you want to do that, there are some possibilities, but that, that's a separate step. So the, the imaging and restoring is always an equal size, it's the same size. Cloning is similar to imaging, uh, except that uh, with the cloning, uh, both ends of the uh, process are uh, disks or partitions or whatever. So, for instance, if you want to make a backup or, or move a uh, partition uh, to another one, you could make an image and then restore the image to another partition. Cloning goes directly, so it just takes, takes the contents of one partition and copies it directly, sector by sector, to another partition. Or it takes the whole disk copy it sector by sector to another disk. This is called the disk to disk block. It's the fastest way to use it to make a copy or whatever. Uh, for instance, one thing you could do is uh, if you uh, change your hard disk in, in the laptop, for instance, you just clone the old one, this is usually smaller, clone it to a larger one, and then expand or add partitions to the thing that cloning is used for a lot now. So I use it a lot for backups. Uh, uh, Important data or operating system partitions are usually back to back up on the second hard disk in the system or the USB disk. You just use cloning for that. So it's very easy to just clone it uh, to back up this and then clone it back. It's just almost as if it's cloudable. It just takes a little more time. Okay, there is some special handling possible for bad second areas. Uh, so if you've got a, a disk that is failing, then you can. Uh, Add some options to the cloning uh, to tell it to uh, to try to retry that second area. Uh, also, you can also merge 
uh, so you can make a call uh, where we will leave the original stuff in that and only follow all the career cycles. So you mentioned starting it as a file for uh, backup, but can you in real time clone it from one drive to another using, for example, a drive tray? Using what? A drive tray. You can put yes. two hard drives in the ThinkPad. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You can do that then. Mm -hmm. Is that explained in the documentation? Yes, it's cloning, disk to disk cloning. So if you've got two identical disks, same yeah. size, uh, then you can just make a copy of that one disk to another. Okay, okay, but suppose they're different sizes, as you mentioned. You're upgrading, so, you're upgrading your drive. Yeah. Okay, but so I, the, the smaller drive would be the one that's in the, uh, uh, used uh, in the ThinkPad. You put the drive tray in, and put the second larger drive in, exactly. you can either you can clone those. it or you could create it as a file and... Well, if you create it as a file, you need some storage somewhere to, to put that file. Okay, so you wouldn't create it as a file, then. You, would just, you would be directly disk to disk exactly. in real time. Because then you don't need the intermediate space. Okay, and can you... Suppose you have two machines. Can you connect them via a LAN cable, a crossover cable, and clone them that way? Well, you can, as long as the operating system that you're running DFC from uh, has network access. Because the operating system has to use the network. You see, it's not network aware, so the operating system has to take care of that. But as long as your operating system can see that other disk over the network, using uh, SMB or whatever protocol, uh, as long as you have uh, low level access, you can do that. Probably cloning will not work that way. You can probably use imaging that way, uh, but not cloning. Because uh, over a network, using most network protocols, you don't have low level sector access, which is what cloning would use. So uh, if you want to use a network, you probably have to use imaging. But one of the founders of imaging, by the way, if, if you do this, is that the image file, if you store it somewhere and then restore it on the other disk, the image file is also backup. So, to fill something up, you still have that in the spot. Yes, yes. A question, question to me, the, the format, uh, do you mean partition the, 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 the target drive uh, before you clone it? Or? It depends. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if you do a disk to disk clone, you don't have to do anything because every sector on the destination disk is replaced by the corresponding sector of the source. But you need the exact same disk size? Uh, or larger. Or larger. But a larger means wasted. Or, or uh, not necessarily. If you do a disk to disk clone, then there will be, uh, say, you've got a 100 gig disk and you copy it to 500 gig, then there will be 400 gigs that are unused on the new disk. But it's just unallocated space. You can create new positions there. Okay, but it will not be, the, the, the target will not be, will not be blown up to the full size? No, no. Okay. no there's, there's no automatic resizing okay. anywhere. Okay. Okay. There, is, there is some resizing, but just on file systems, and it's a bit restricted. But yes. then you can enlarge that. After you clone it, you can enlarge that? Uh, uh, with the UCL, some file systems, you can enlarge HPFS, you can enlarge uh, FAT file systems, uh, you cannot enlarge JFS, it's not implemented. Uh, so, what I usually do, because disks are used these days, what I usually do is just make the copies anyway. So, uh, create a new partition, make it much larger, uh, and copy everything over on the file by file basis. It also has the uh, advantage that everything is in the defect method. So you go to fresh partition, format it, and then copy the data over. And then only if you, and then you can reassign drive letters, so if you use LVM, to, to use a new, bigger partition, you can say that everything works out, works okay, then you can later delete the old If you do it that way, then you have a backup also, as long as you want to. Delete the old one and maybe use that space for something else. And, and can you actually do this like if you booted off the first drive uh, running an actual OS on it? Can you do this underneath it while it's running? Or do you, well, you, well, you, you can, but I wouldn't recommend it. Because so you would boot off a, a third thing? Okay. Yes, but that's the best way to do it. But it usually works. I mean, cloning, just copying a running operating system will work, but the 
uh, well, PUC is running, obviously, and, and the operating system is running. So some of the things on the disk will, will change during the deployment process, right. which means that the copy is not 100% consistent. Mm -hmm. It will usually work, but you don't know exactly uh, what's wrong. So, yeah. uh, it, it's very much like uh, just switching off a machine and then switching it back on again. Because of the running system and, and it got frozen in, in some sort of way, either by disconnecting the power or by plugging it over to something else, and then starting up again. It will probably work, just check this will probably do a job. Mm -hmm. a job but uh, no guarantees, so it's not recommended. If you're copying, you gave an example of 100 bit to a 500 bit. But if it was a 100 bit to a 2000 bit, where the sector sizes are not the same between them, is that still one? Well, the sector size are the same, but the, uh, the cylinder size, the oh, okay. geometry will be different. And then you have a problem there. Because if you do this to this clone, then it will, all the cylinder alignments and stuff will be based on the old disk. Yeah. So on the new disk, will might be the same. And, uh, Actually, my, uh, I think that I use it at home for, for my development. Well, I do a little bit of development right now as well. Uh, it has a, a, a terabyte drives in it, but it only used the first 500 gigs for us too. Because, because of the same reason more or less. I could have just created everything new, and, and, uh, but it's simpler uh, because I don't need that in space on this equal station anyway. But the terabyte. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I decided to just leave it at that and the first 500 gigs is used for the station or accessible for the station and the rest is only used for, for Windows because it's on the radio and I also use that for uh, so. How about uh, about the files and the DLL stuff? That's not a problem because because on the very low level when you clone the clone this is no, that's not, not really a problem. Lock files or something? That, that's only... So it's on the lower level, level. It's, it's, it's copied on the lower level. Yeah, and file locking and stuff is only known at the uh, operating system level and, and uh, stuff like that. But if you go low level at the disk, everything is accessible. Uh, except for the fact that uh, DMC does not account for some things changing underneath. So okay. it's just copying everything over uh, sequentially. Okay. And, and if, well, things like small file is no problem, of course. But, uh, you never know what's being written back. And if you're cloning a partition, uh, like sometimes it's confusing what's exactly the same size. Like mm -hmm. the numbers don't always match if exactly. you that's can't create the, one that's the same. Well, they, they don't match if the disk geometry is different than uh -huh. the disk. So because the disk geometry uh, uh, is the number of uh, uh, seconds per track and the number of uh, right. tracks in the cylinder. And if that's different, then uh, yeah, there might be a few megabytes different. So if, if you have that, what you could do is uh, uh, make sure the new one is a few megabytes larger than the old one. So it'll, it'll work, and just you need to be sure there's enough room by being yeah. a little wastage. Yeah, a few megabytes uh, wastage. Uh, and then it will work, because inside a partition there's no sense of geometry, but it's just a bunch of sectors. Yes. With, with the uh, USB or the disk, when you boot from that, it gives you a choice at that moment of which operating system you're going to uh, use? Yes. That's the first screen you'll see what, Actually, what will be on the memory stick, the USB stick, is uh, a grub-based bootloader, which uh, instead of the normal booting of partitions, will offer you a choice of booting uh, ISO files. So, uh, and actually, there's a, there's a long menu listed there, which I commented out most of it. There's only two choices left, which is the DFC, the ISO, which has free DOS on it, in it, and also the, the DOS version of DUC. And there's a, a, an ISO file for, uh, I'm not sure what the exact name but it's a small Linux distribution. And you can boot either of those two. And uh, if you boot the DUC ISO, then you get into free DOS and DUC automatically. If you want to boot into Linux, uh, you first have to make sure that all your Linux you can see executables are also copied onto the stick, which uh, is, is something you have to do after creating it. Uh, and then after booting Linux, you get into a Linux uh, desktop, which is fully functional. You can even go on, on the web if you want to. Uh, but you can also uh, click on the uh, uh, file manager in Linux and then start PUC from that. And then you have access to the disks that are connected to the system. Okay, anything else? Oh, 
but just get back on the uh, recording. There was a question earlier if you need to partition or format or anything. Uh, as a summary, if you do a disk to disk clone, you don't have to do anything. If you do a partition to partition clone, then you have to make sure that on the receiving end you have created a partition already, which is of uh, sufficient size. So the same size or a little bit larger. Uh, but you don't have to format that because the whole contents of the thing, including the file system format, the structures, etc., are being cloned over from the other partition. The summary is the difference between the partition to partition or the disk to disk. You could use DFC itself to create that before you... Yes, actually if you use the menu, there are also a few higher level selections that say uh, copy partition. And what it will actually do is just two things. It will create a partition destination where you choose it, you choose some free space area of this and we create a partition there uh, and then clone in contents. So there is higher level operations for copy. There's also one that's uh, called uh, move I think. We'll do the same thing but afterwards and we'll delete the old partition. And I guess they're smart enough to, to account for different geometries so they will if they create yeah. a partition now okay. So well um, more or less, what it will do is the create partition will perform to the geometry on the new disk, and then the, the partition to partition cloning will uh, uh, just fill in the surface. So, yeah. So, will it go up to the next higher, uh, next bigger partition level? So, so that the yeah, it would, but that, that means if you, do, uh, if you want to do a whole disk that way, if there's five partitions, then you have to do five uh, copies of that one. And when doing that, it's always tricky if, if the stuff is bootable and, and there are probably wood managers that may have all kinds of hidden uh, knowledge about where things are. It doesn't work very well. So that's why I usually stick to this to this cloning and I'm pretty sure it will work. Okay. And then work from there. Okay, then the next uh, topic uh, found over here. Let me leave that's also uh, a huge area. Well, used to be. I think it's less. Um, the two things you can do with this, uh, what, what this actually does is to look into a file system, identify where the directory information is in whatever form it is, whether it's file or HTTPS or whatever, uh, and, and know where the, the sectors are for the file that you are interested in. And then create a new file somewhere and copy the contents of it. So it's more or less like a clone of a single file. You want to make a copy of all the related data and create a new file somewhere else. And you can use that mechanism in two ways. You can either use it to undelete a file, uh, a file that has been deleted, the file system usually is still there, the data is still there, but the uh, description of it, uh, and especially the directory entry of it will be done. Uh, but on most file systems, you can reconstruct a lot of them just create a new file with the contents somewhere else. So that would effectively be uh, undeleted. Uh, the other thing is, uh, uh, in this way you can get access to file contents that are on file systems that are not accessible from the operating system. For instance, uh, using DFC, I can copy a file from an NTFS uh, partition without having an NTFS drive. So I just go into the NTFS file system and use DFC and Recover uh, file after finding it in its directory structure and stuff like that, and then copy it to an SDFS or a JFS drive, then still be able to, uh, to look at it. Of course, you're working on a copy then, it's not really file access, you cannot use it, you can open it uh, and put it in an application or something. You have to create a copy and then do with it whatever you like. But I've been using that in the past a few times to do better things that are uh, hard to get to in another way. Certain structures can be, re uh, can be uh, kind of rebuilt, I guess you could say, uh, if they're damaged or lost. Uh, in, in file systems? Yes. And to some extent, yes. That, that there is some functionality that it's, it's comparable to what uh, check is doing on a lot of file systems or that it's a uh, file system check and it's check. Well, there's not that much about it. Because what DFC implements are just a few specific fixed plots for specific problems in 
their response systems. There's no overall thing called to check this or something that tries to fix everything. So, uh, well, so file systems uh, are really complex, and uh, usually the, the check programs that come with it, check this stuff, uh, is, uh, is good enough. So that's what I use. Uh, but there are a few problems that are uh, easily fixed and sometimes not easily uh, manageable with other tools. So there are a few fix commands and menu items in BFC, uh, but there's no full take this first time. Now, if you, can re if you accidentally deleted a whole directory, yeah. this can recover the whole directory? Or do you have to? Well, that depends on the file system. Usually not. What, what, uh, depending on the file system, what BFC will allow you to do is uh, look for uh, deleted files, for instance, and it will make a list of all those, but the directory structure is lost. So you can recover them to somewhere else, but then you have to figure out where they go on. And actually, depending on the file system, it will also recreate those directories, but they will be empty, so you have to place the files where they go on. And you would know what directories uh, have been there before. Okay. Okay. And that sort of thing you can do in the OS while it's up and running without the problems at the disk level? Uh, yeah, because you're just reading. Right. The only, there's very small chance that you might get on a file that it has, it's being modified while you're doing it. That's, right. For deleted files, that chance is about zero. Right. <laughs> <laughs> True. Okay. Maybe reallocate the space, though. Are you, are you looking at the, you looking at the long MEA as well on um, JFS? Uh, Yes and no. I'm not looking at it real time, but not while uh, searching for the public, but there is a function in DSC that will uh, allow to get the uh, one name, the A name, and uh, store it elsewhere. And then DSC can use that as well. Because there's some, some unused space in the iNodes and the JFS. You can use that to uh, uh, store the whole file. Because normally on the JFS and also all the other Linux files, it's supposed to read files. The file name if I was gone, because that Yeah, that's why I was asking if you were looking at Yeah, because on, on, on Unix-like systems, there can be multiple file names all pointed to the same physical file. So the directory entry that has all the information about, at least about the name, uh, if you delete it, it's really gone. It's not inside the F node or whatever you have in SVFS or other people. It also has file name. It's really separate because they will not point to the same stuff. And the, the I know on, on JFS and on uh, other Linux houses only contains information about some attributes, about file allocation, and stuff like that. So that's, that's still there. The file name is lost. So there is a, a feature in BFC. Uh, if you open the JFS file system, you can select that from the menu. And what it will do is, is uh, copy those file names put it into a reserved area in the right now. And the only one being able to use that is the HP itself, the covers. Uh, because normally if you recover JFS or, or other things, we just make up a file name, uh, created from a uh, sector address and stuff like that, so it's a cryptic name. Uh, if you uh, run this uh, utility like thing on a regular basis, then uh, if you have a basic problem and you try to recover the individual files, uh, you that at least on live now, simply the files will have the original file names. It's much like the old HPFS file system uh, that had a small first 50 characters of the file name stored in the end of it. It was for the same purpose because if you delete the file there, the wrong file name will be gone. But the first 50 characters will <coughs> remain in the end now, which is very useful for the book. So I made something similar for JFS as a document or as a document. Okay. Uh, it's, it's not implemented for all the file systems, by the way. It's mainly for HPFS, NPFS, and JFS. And a little bit for FAT. But FAT is also difficult in recovery because there's not enough redundancy to do it correctly. And usually on FAT, if you delete a file and, and the files are fragmented, uh, they're lost. And on Linux, what file systems do you support? There's like you know, a whole alphabet suit there. <laughs> Not that many. Uh, not, not everything. Uh, I, I have some support for uh, EX2 uh, and 
three, mm -hmm. also four, although there's a lot of numbers associated with this more just number. Uh, there's support for the rise of the power system. Mm -hmm. uh, and the planet is also support for uh, newer stuff, like uh, the best and the The support implemented for those file systems is mainly uh, knowing the internal structure and the final location to be able to do smart cloning and smart imaging and stuff. Uh, and for those file systems, there's no file recovery yet. Mm -hmm. Because that's a lot more work, because they also have to interpret all the directory structures and all these and stuff. And what is this, uh, the Mac use for? Some uh, other it's HFS, HFS Plus. Uh -huh. yeah. It's also its own file system. And I have very limited support for that. Uh, there is a version of DMC that runs on the Mac on those sites. Uh, but it has the same capabilities as all the others. So it cannot really do much with the stuff on the Mac itself. Well, it can interpret the petition values because they are also different on the Mac. Mm -hmm. And let Windows versus up with it. GPT instead of the original uh, MBR and stuff. Yeah, are there newer Windows file systems that you can't deal with? No, it's, it's not newer, it's not about newer file systems. It's a new style of partitioning. Instead uh -huh. of using the classic partition tables, uh, they're using uh, something called GPT, two uh, ID partitioning tables. The more universal and uh, more capable of using really large list and many partitions and more descriptive stuff like that. It's, it's a lot better in, in a lot of ways, but it's different, so. And I don't have full support for that yet. Uh, I have read out the support. Maybe I'll be able to show something about that later, or, or tomorrow, but I'll do some more hands-on things, show different versions. Because at the moment, uh, on, on this same system, it's running OS X, but it's also running uh, Windows XP, uh, ECS, and uh, FreeDOS, all simultaneously, because they're really virtual boxes. So I, I, could, I could show all the uh, DFC versions of this one machine. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Let's Let's time to go. We went until 12, right? So we have now. Additions. I already saw some of them in the previous small presentation. So we can get a couple of them. Most of the menus are less than half the items and 
lot of dialogues, so it makes a lot of uh, chair classes and stuff like that. It makes it a lot easier to uh, comprehend, especially for uh, most end users. <coughs> and there's some support now, not completely for the dot file system, and there's also support for the inspect file system, which is something uh, that's probably becoming more important over time because it's the only way to handle really large volumes using the file system. And actually, uh, on uh, memory cards, SD cards over 32 gigabytes, it's uh, actually uh, the desired file system. So other file systems are not supported those cards. So cameras and stuff like that are using the ESCAP file system. Uh, and of course, the back and the uh, windows have drivers for that, so they won't notice the difference. Uh, but you can say it's less driver, or something. This is one way that at least you can look at it and do some recovery and stuff like that. So I'm trying to get the uh, instead uh, functionality to the same level as they have for the other power file system. Okay, then some, some features that uh, have uh, uh, gone into PC since uh, the later versions, version 9. And one of the changes I made there was a uh, contents based uh, disk geometry, because disk geometry is a thing that really uh, keeps haunting everybody. Uh, it's, it's, technically, it's not needed anymore, it hasn't been for 20 years at least. Uh, still, uh, because of the way design decisions uh, have been made in the past and stuff like that. A lot of tools and operating systems react differently on, on geometry. Geometry is just a, a rule. It's nothing technically. It's really probably for the audience, but these days it's just a convention. And like how are we going to lay out uh, our partitions and stuff uh, over this huge range of sector numbers. And it's still laid out as if it were a physical disk with multiple players and multiple sides and tracks on those disks. This really is not the case, but it totally made it, but you don't see that from the outside of the disk. You've got SSD disks these days, which are just memory chips, so uh, no tracks, no players, nothing. Uh, and still they use the same concept uh, of disk geometry. Uh, and it's sometimes hard to get the right geometry uh, past getting passed to you as an application on PUC from the operating system because the operating systems usually don't really agree amongst each other what the right geometry will be for this kind of disk. Uh, so what I decided to implement is a complex based uh, thing. So it's looking at the partition tables, looking at LVM information to see uh, what the geometry uh, was when those partitions were created or changed or whatever. That works a lot better than just asking the operating system because it's more often than not it's wrong. Okay, uh, you can still disable it using switches or using the menu system. If you've got a disk that is not uh, interpreted correctly by the AC, you can still uh, switch it off. How okay. do you know? Sorry? How do you know it's not correct? <laughs> Well, usually if you get a lot of warnings from DFC, then, then one of the, about partitions not being online and stuff like that, yeah. uh, that, it's, that that's an indication that your disk geometry is not correct. Okay. Uh, of course, the warnings could also be genuine. I mean, if you create partitions using different tools, then often you end up with partitions that are created in different geometries. And then whatever geometry you let DFC use, one of the partitions will cause a problem because it's not aligned to that particular geometry. But remember, geometry is just a convention, and there are not many things that are really having a problem with incorrect geometry. Some things are, like older Windows versions, some OS2 versions have problems with it. You get the wrong, wrong alignment on a partition and would boot, for instance. Because for some reason it was looking in the wrong position. So it's not that often a problem, but it's, uh, it's a thing to be aware of. Some tools are very picky, like Partition uh, Magic was very picky about Partition Alignment. It wouldn't touch anything if it thought it was in there. Okay, um, 
has some more uh, living support in there, like the uh, EXP and riser file systems, and some grub, the, the living school manager, display and reporting. Uh, and you see it would generate its own documentation about the menu stuff, but that's more for me than it's for you. has been scripting in DFC, meaning that uh, everything in DFC can be done using commands. Uh, even if you drive those to a menu system, it still will execute uh, a command to implement the function. And you could put those uh, commands in a, in a text file and have them executed sequentially. That is all scripting stuff in DFC. And it, it was good enough for a while, but at some point you want to make more uh, intelligent scripts that, that usually test something and do things based on what it seems, whatever, or make things more uh, robust and less error uh, prone. So uh, I decided I needed a better scripting language and I've been looking around to use something existing. Uh, but it was very difficult to find something that was powerful enough and also simple enough to implement and available on all the platforms that I needed to use it on, which was DOS, uh, OS2, Windows, and Linux. So eventually I decided to just uh, uh, build on the stuff I had and, and add some intelligence uh, to it uh, that allowed uh, if statements and while statements, stuff like that, and some built-in functions to get data out of DSU, stuff like that. So, uh, so that was added in version 9, data scripting. Uh, there's, there's a separate presentation about that, depending on time, I may show that later. Oh, there's also uh, in the uh, low level, if you look at low level, uh, this is stuff, you can find it also look at it uh, to this uh, assembly point. You can call it, for instance, in the boot sectors or in the MDR or whatever. whatever. If you find an executable, just use PFC, then this is something that's fine. What level is the CPU? Most CPUs, I think, up to. Well, maybe not the very latest in ARMS, but to uh, uh, inventing stuff. But not XMM, SD, SSL? No, no, but we'll do the, the, uh, either uh, 16, 32, or 64 bit uh, instruction. We uh, call it DOS. It's using uh, DI Store, which is a, a, a library, a disassembly library, on the It's very well. And does it understand uh, executable file formats also? You said yeah, exe absolutely. files. You'd have to know where the yeah. execution begins. Yeah, it's okay. just looking at raw sectors, actually. Okay. Uh, but you can choose to, to not look at them in, in a hexadecimal format, but in disassembly format. Gotcha. I usually you have to uh, scroll back, uh, forward and back a little bit to align to the instructions because you can put start in the middle of the instructions. Right. And you just got to look at so you have to you have to know a little bit of assembly to know when it's right. You also have to select 60 and 32 or 64 bit. And you also do that based on what you see. If it looks gibberish, it's probably the wrong, the wrong stuff. <laughs> but it's mainly meant to look at stuff like wood sectors and stuff like that. Uh, uh, more or less just a script, so, it, so it's, it's written in, in that uh, new scripting language. It's using DFC commands to first uh, erase uh, your USB stick, then partition it, add LVM information, and stuff like that. And, uh, I also think it starts off with storing an image file to a prepared image that's comes with DFC. Uh, and then it uh, will uh, expand it to match the actual size and stuff like that, so it's rather complicated. Uh, but it's, it's written in, in that uh, scripting language. Uh, there's a menu item uh, that will 
do all that for you. So usually all you have to do is get a memory to get the USB stick, right. plug it in. Why would I do that rather than just use Yummy to put it out here? Well, because they're not easy, easily uh, to get. What? But you mean those, the, the prepared ones? Or oh yeah, I don't get it. Like I said, I will download it. Yeah. Put the ISO in the jacket. Put it in the side? Yeah. No, he's talking about something else, I think. No, it's a bootable USB stick. Yeah. What do you see on the door? It's got DSC on it. It's also got the AVG rescue on it. Okay, yeah, well, well, there are different nice. ways. This, this is just one way. Okay. To do, create uh, something that can boot free DOS. Uh, or Linux and use the yeah. Of course, there are multiple ways to do the same thing. But this well, is I don't want to use the script because it will wipe out whatever else is on the thing. Your script. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everything, yeah. What is going to ask for help <laughs> the script? That's why it's free. Your your Linux distro, does it have uh, JFS in or JFS? Uh, it's been that's yeah. appropriate to yeah. it's not sure. It needs to it's a rather dated one. It's a bit rough, that rough Linux and it's the, the, the ISO I use set one is about five or six years old. Mm -hmm. uh, but you could add your own because uh, actually what I told before, the, the bootable USB state is just uh, it's a boot manager that allows you to boot ISOs. So, uh, you know, there's just the menu on LSD, it's just in the root of the text file. Uh, you can add your own session in there and say, okay, it's got this, this menu line that wants to start that ISO file. And just copy the ISO file. The, the difficult thing about it is, because it's an ISO file, uh, there's no DFC installed into it. It's just an edit to Yeah. Uh, and with the one I deliver, more or less automatically, allows you to start the EC, which is in another directory on the same memory stick. So you just go to the file browser that's on Linux, or go to the light open, which is on the depends on what Linux distribution you have. And you'll find the EC and there's an uh, icon in there, you just click it. So the way that works differs from the different Linux distributions. Uh, scripting analysis. I don't have a few dozen in that release. Sorted so you can sort the uh, name or, or other properties. Uh, it's just a, a user interface and also it makes it easier in some ways to do Also, sort the things like partition pages. Uh, then, another thing, bootable JFS added uh, some workaround for booting problems uh, when you've got mixed up with drive loaders. And what it did is uh, add uh, the drive loader that was assigned to the position to boot, which is normally kept on the uh, deep station in the, in the LVM information. So you can change it. Uh, it keeps a copy of the drive loader in the boot sector. It's a sort of last resort uh, to avoid the uh, always to get an operator hard disk or one problem. Uh, lose track of the drive loader while booting. Uh, so I added support for that. For JFS, also for HPFS. Actually, uh, two or three months ago, when I started working with the virtual disk stuff, I went to uh, a problem where actually this disk turned out to be uh, the solution. Uh, for some reason, I installed a virtual box and I ended up in a situation where the platforms were in there. I'm uh, uh, not, not sure if it was familiar with virtual disk or virtual box, but what it actually does is it's put your complete computer is into a single file. And you can have more of those. So I had three or four uh, virtual box disks for different installations of the station. 
And what I did to copy over some tools was to just mount attach one of those other disks to my running virtual version of Evo Station. And of course, because I had signed originally, I had signed the same drive letter for all of the key for Evo Station. Uh, I'd have to pick another drive letter because it was a drive letter company and it chose something like G or whatever it was. But for some reason, it didn't check this one. What the checklist does is replace that drive letter and boots it. It says it's a G. And the next time I tried to boot, there was conflict because the, the boots are a G. The LVM info said something else, and the, the confidence is uh, also that the words. So uh, they failed to boot. And it took me a while to figure out that it was because of when I had a checklist running, manipulated this time, so it was fairly easy to, to update this. Uh, do you see uh, fixed boot command uh, as, as an option now to uh, specify the drive that you want to have inserted into the list? Also, some fixes for the enhanced format stuff. Uh, enhanced format is, is a term used uh, for SSD disks, also 4K uh, size and second disk, where uh, this is our layout of a geometry where the cylinder size, which is nothing physical anymore, but the cylinder size is uh, one megabyte. Uh, and it's being used by uh, most GPT style partitions. It's also used by later Windows installs. Uh, and there's better support for that in DUC now. You can say that you can use that uh, method of laying out the uh, participants. Uh, and there's display only support for that GPT style because it's used by the Mac and by Windows and stuff. So you can look at this like uh, on this Mac, you can look at this and see what the pieces are. Uh, you can not manipulate it. Business or change them or something. Uh, see what they are. Well, in the old DFC version, all you would see was a sort of like a guard position because I still have the R. It only says the whole disk is being used as a GPT style disk. And, and the internal uh, structure of that is in different locations. That's what uh, was being added to version 11. You can look at that information. And some other thing, we said that sectors, that's another thing uh, that's sometimes used after cloning. If you've got a bad disk, a uh, large disk with empty <coughs> for instance, and it has bad sectors, and you clone it to a new one, and everything's okay. Except that you still have the, the 45 megabytes of bad sectors that are still marked as bad sectors in the TFS. Well, on the new disk, those sectors are okay. So if you want to reuse those, you have to reset that internal administration in the TFS to zero. So that and that's being implemented for NTFS, HTTPS, FAT. So this is after cloning a bad disk to a good one that you can replay those uh, <coughs> uh, sectors that were marked as bad. Uh, then for uh, then some optimizations for the uh, uh, WPI installer, I always do this is actually it's more or less uh, synchronizing everything more than it was before. Because the, the uh, installation from the zip file for the UC was had a different directory structure than, than, than the UPI. So clear that up a little bit. Sorry? There's about five minutes left. Okay, yeah. Well, it's probably, uh, probably close to me. Basic and expert using effects. The default is to use basic power. Uh, and I'll, uh, I'll show some of that tomorrow. It won't be the hands on today, I think. Uh, but it, it's a lot simpler to look at and, and easier to use. Uh, and for anything really complicated, you just have to switch to the expert mode. Uh, then there's uh, uh, searching and then yeah, graph functionality. So, so search for certain terms to get a list of uh, possible bits, uh, both in the help but also in the output text. So if you've got a long UC session and you've got pages and pages of output, you can search through it. It's, it's often very good. Um, and also searching in the help is also useful because sometimes you know, you know something about a certain topic but it's hard to find in the help or in the new system. Uh, 
that that is support for the VSCAP file system. Is that right? It's, it's uh, okay for 12.1. Features that will get there for a while. You can do binary editing. Um, you can know, use screens, and you've got a high resolution screen. Uh, you use something like uh, 200 columns or something, and, and 80 rows or something. You know, and you use display of uh, a lot of data. You can search in it, stuff like that. It's a very flexible binary editor. <laughs> More enhancement to the scripting. It's still better to put on all the older uh, scripts, but it is uh, much better at checking both expressions and uh, grouping stuff, additional stuff. The idea to show some uh, mm -hmm. scripts. This is the creation of the purple stick that's been mentioned a few times. Uh, Next slide, you'll see what it looks like if you put that. Uh, this is actually the opening screen of the Travel Brother had a specific image uh, made for it. So it's a Linux uh, thing on UC. Uh, and as you can see, you can select uh, Freelance and, and uh, Park Magic Linux. And it also tells you where to find the UC. So it's not really in the, in the ISO that you put, but it's on the same memory state, so it knows where to find it. Yeah. If you know how it works, it's very easy to update this menu to add other ISOs to boot, like other recovery stuff. This is how you use it. With either freelance and you can actually make it uh, work the way that it also has access to the USB stick itself. But this is a bit tricky because then the FreeDOS needs USB drivers and the USB drivers that are there are a bit flaky because they're not really officially supported, they're just floating around on the internet and using them, but it's sometimes you get uh, problems. In that case, you could use one of the other selections that just lets it boot from the USB stick but only has access to everything else. So uh, the advantage is that it then works. This problem is that you cannot store it in the log file, so we can get analysis files or everything on that set was mistake or you can do this. Is there a size limit on the USB sticks that will accept this? Sorry? Is there a size limit on the USB sticks that will uh, accept this? Like 32 gigs or something like that? I think it's 32 gig, yeah. Uh -huh. Because it depends. Uh, what it actually do is I restore a uh, prepared image it's from a 32 gig stick. Mm -hmm. I restore that to your memory stick and then it decides the file system to match the actual size. So the level gets larger than 32 gigs. If it is larger, you can still, after doing it, you can still create a second data partition in the remaining space. But the, the extra, it will only use up to 32 gigs. Okay. Uh, if, if the free does not, it doesn't work very well and it depends on your hardware, Linux one will usually uh, do better. And also, I plan to update that Linux thing uh, to, to more recent Linux distributions to be more file systems and that stuff. Uh, it's hard to find Linux stuff that I can integrate into my more or less commercial product without uh, having problems with the licensing and stuff like that. So it, it's a bit of a, it is what it is. In addition to the actual BBC program, and try to uh, try to make it work as best as I can. Uh, but uh, there's not that much I can do. So okay, that's about it for now. Uh, and tomorrow, uh, I'll have some information about file systems and more difficult stuff. Uh, and there will be more time for questions, and I'll do some hands-on hands -on with the BBC so the various versions. Show what they look like. Okay, so most of the questions you want to go away for tomorrow because it's not time. Okay.